Hi, and welcome to the November 14, 2012 Plastic Reconstructive and Cosmetic Surgery Journal Club. My name is Dr. Damien Marucci, and I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. This is Dr. Matthew Starr, uh, who's one of the plastic surgery registrars working with me at St. George Hospital at the moment. So Matthew, today we did four papers. The first paper was a comparison of a new skin closure device and intradermal sutures in the closure of full thickness surgical incisions. So basically this was the Prinio yeah, system. The now, Prinio now, 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 what did people think about this paper? Uh, pe people were generally um, impressed with the fact that it was multi-centered, it was you know ranging across uh, five countries, it was you know uh, from respected surgeons. Um, yep. However um, there were some parts about uh, the, the study that they, they weren't as impressed with. Yeah, I think, um, look, it was certainly very good in the sense that there was randomization. It was a control trial. Obviously, there was a lot of follow-up going up for uh, between 6 and 12 months. A relatively large number of patients in multiple centres in multiple countries, as you said. Uh, there are a couple of concerns. Obviously, the, uh, the research was sponsored by Ethicon, who are the producers of the Prinio material. Um, and the results obviously were, were good. It showed that there was an equivalence in terms of cosmesis. Uh, there was a slight increase in pain. Is that right? Yeah, with Prinio. Increase yeah. in pain with the Prinio. Um, and there was two cases of blistering yes. out of 86. But that was only in the early time points, relatively. It wasn't there. At, yeah, it was at uh, 24 hours and seven days. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of long term. One of the issues that I had with it was um, it wasn't clear from the paper whether the randomization was done in terms of which half of the wound was going to be closed with Prinio as opposed to a subcuticular suture before or after the interrupted intradermal sutures were put. I think it would have been nice if you had just known that the intradermal sutures were placed, then the wounds were randomized into either Prinio or subcuticular um, because certainly some of the surgeons who I've spoken to who've used the Prinio system, I haven't myself used it, uh, were saying that they just felt they needed to put more uh, deep dermal sutures in order to hold yeah. everything together. So it wasn't clear from the paper whether or not yeah. people were able to compensate yes. uh, because they knew which side would be the Prinio uh, versus the intradermal uh, running suture. Yeah. The other thing was that the assessment was not blinded. The surgeons knew which side has which. It would have been nice in a big paper like this if they had it just got... A, an external party uh, who didn't know which side had which and just assessed the wounds at 12 months or six months and just said, look, they're the same or they're not the same or whatever. That just would have been a nice, because then you could have had a blinded randomized control trial. Yes, and there was some queries about the inclusion criteria which weren't really detailed because, I mean, for such a large, you know, five centers across um, five, four, four countries, um, over a couple of years, 88 wounds is, is, is not a lot. You would have thought, you know, perhaps with that many people involved, they would have recruited hundreds. So perhaps they were being more selective than, than perhaps they are making out that they were. Good point. Okay, now the next paper was the outcomes of tissue expander implant breast reconstruction in the setting of pre-construction radiation. Certainly in Sydney, uh, I don't think many plastic surgeons would be comfortable performing implant uh, um, tissue expander implant reconstruction in the presence of uh, 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 chest wall irradiation. Uh, so this paper was certainly very good because it meant that we actually uh, have some numbers now which we can give to patients. What did people think about this study? Well, I think it's a very honest study. Yes. And uh, I think it confirmed um, perhaps the fears or the intuition uh, that yeah. a lot of people have about um, implant breast reconstruction in the irradiated patient. Yeah. Um, and uh, most, but most people at, at the journal club would probably be reluctant to offer that um, yeah. Yeah. In, in this uh, population. Yeah. Well, yeah. Although, one, although some would. And, yeah. And, and they would simply, yeah. they said they would simply, as the authors advise, um, explain the risks and, and give them the numbers and they yeah. make the choice. Yeah, and I mean, the risk, 40% risk of uh, 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 reconstructive failure is obviously an incredibly high uh, percentage. So I would hope that if patients heard that, then they'd say, look, okay, look, you know, I'm just gonna have to accept a scar on my back or or whatever. Yeah. Um, one and of the issues- The 60% issue yeah. complication rate in smokers. Uh, yes. You know, people are saying, you know, yes. perhaps, you know, in smokers uh, with- You don't even give them- yeah. yeah, you don't give them the option. Absolute contraindication. Yep. Um, the follow-up certainly was very good. 
uh, two of the issues which were raised was that they only offered this to patients where they said the chest wall soft tissues were suitable uh, post radiotherapy but then they didn't go through to describe uh, or to give numbers in terms of how many were deemed not suitable so of the 10 patients who had the delayed reconstruction was it a case of where 90 were deemed not suitable or five were deemed not suitable just, just want to get a feel for uh, exactly how they made that decision because it seemed very subjective obviously and also just what sort of numbers we're talking about uh, the other issues which they raised was it's not clear because the follow-up was so short whether there's a high incidence of capsular contracture in these patients because the tissue expander and then the implant is basically sitting subcutaneously certainly in the lower pole that's right where there's no muscular so coverage. the figures could actually be much scarier could be much scarier and that paper then leads us on to the next paper, which is the adipose tissue grafting to the post mastectomy irradiated chest wall, preparing the ground for implant reconstruction. This is a French paper published in uh, j in 2011. Um, so in summary, this paper, they're actually doing one to three fat grafting sessions in the irradiated chest wall, then doing tissue expansion, uh, followed by uh, implant placement. Um, now, what do people think about this paper? I think in general people were impressed. They were impressed yeah. with uh, the results that they were able to achieve. Um, it was an, sort of an intuition-based hypothesis, and uh, essentially on the basis of this paper, it looks like it, it has worked. A lot of people are excited about the future, but hesitant. Um, yeah. Hesitant about the oncogenic potential of, of fat stem cells. Yes. And... Um, I think that's the, yeah, that, yeah. That's the big concern yeah, that yeah, was expressed. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so certainly during the Journal Club, Dr. Amira Sankey you've raised the concerns about the potential oncogenic potential, uh, the oncogenic potential of uh, uh, fat grafted cells uh, in an irradiated field, which had previously had a breast cancer in it. Um, although Scott Turner sort of was very gung-ho and thought that uh, in years to come, we'll all be doing this and no one will be doing LD breast reconstructions. Five uh, years. In five years, five. sorry. One of the things I really liked about this paper was the technique which the author described for recreating the inframammary fold. This is something which I'd heard about from um, James Southall Keeley who did his fellowship in Lyon, uh, where basically an abdominal flap was raised and then the abdominal tissue is elevated up, um, an incision is made through scarpus fascia and then that's sutured down to the chest wall in order to recreate a fold. And if you look at the photos in the paper, I mean, their, their results really are fantastic. Yeah, the trophic changes in the skin yes. are, are quite, quite noticeable yes. before and after. So. Yes. Yeah, so this could be an alternative to uh, doing an LD flap and certainly a lot better, as we've seen from the previous paper, than just putting a tissue expander in an irradiated chest wall. Yeah, I mean, and, but that was a criticism of the, uh, criticism of the paper. In, from the photos and, and the statistics that were given, um, it's clear that this was uh, quite a thin population. Yes. These fit young women. Uh, yes. So there's perhaps a selection bias there. Yeah. Um, although and, yeah. implant explantation rate of 4% versus 40. Yes. Yeah. That's a golf. It really is. Um, the other thing to note is you said these tend to be thin women where the contralateral breast was normally quite pert with not, you know, they weren't like your, uh, what I'd say, typical uh, sort of broad totic contralateral breast that uh, needs a reduction or, or whatever. Some of them had a, an augmentation mastopexy or just a maxopexy uh, for a matching procedure. But generally it was the thinner, uh, what looked like to be a younger population than certainly um, what's walking through the doors of many of us here in Sydney. It was just the one reduction. Yes. Seven augmentations. Yes, sorry. Yes, that's right. Okay, the final paper was the classic paper. This was the very, very classic Dan Baker lateral rhinodectomy with lateral smastectomy paper from facial plastic surgery in 2000. Um, so this paper described Dan Baker's technique. Um, what do people think of this paper? Everyone... Uh Everyone stood, stood back and nodded. Stood back and nodded and said, and that's said, how you yep, do it. That is that's how you, how you do it. it. And that's how you write a paper on how to do it. It was very nice. Uh, one of the great things was uh, Dan Baker is uh, presenting his experience with 2,500 facelifts in an eight-year period. He's doing more than 300 a year. This is someone with a very high volume uh, facelift practice. And uh, in the paper where he makes a comment saying, look, I'm always going to conferences. I'm seeing people do describe these incredibly complicated facelift uh, techniques and going deeper plane and uh, you know on top of the nerve and taking hours and hours and he just sort of sit back and think look I can do this relatively straightforward technique which is much safer and much faster and where the results are reproducible and um, and uh, it's a it really is 
what I found to be a very good paper, even though I hadn't read it for uh, a year or two. It was, it was great reading it again. Yeah. It gets it done with a minimum of risk. Exactly, and that's what it's all about. Okay, well, I think that's it for this month. Uh, for those of you who are at the Journal Club, I hope you enjoyed it. And for those of you who are listening now, thank you very much for listening. Thank Thanks. You. Bye.